Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you all had an amazing Thanksgiving break. Um, and it's good. I'm glad to see you all got back here, at least from what I can tell, safe and sound. Um, as always, we'll go through our quick announcements real quick and then we'll get on to the lecture. Uh, one thing I do want to say about this week is that these last two lectures in our review of courses, whatever, but the last two lectures are not from the book. They're something that I've kind of added a little bit of filler just to kind of give you all some perspectives on some different tastes of biology and what's going on there. And obviously today we're doing disease ecology, which is kind of cool because it has a lot of implications for some of the stuff that we've been dealing with for the last two years. So while I do have a more wildly focused version of that talk, um, keep in mind that a lot of the things that we'll be talking about today relate just as much to humans as they do animals, because humans are just another kind of animal, right? Um, so typical stuff, uh, quiz 14 is due, it's normal time. Uh, this is your last quiz, take advantage of it. Should be a pretty easy one, especially given the material. Um, one thing I do wanna mention is there's at least one question that stems from the videos that are on web courses. Now, those videos are kind of additional parts of the lecture for Wednesday that are kind of a quick tour through the Arboretum talking about some of the cool different communities that are there so we can put those things into context with some of the stuff y'all might have seen during your iNaturalist assignment, as well as just kind of a quick look at invasive species in Central Florida and what's going on there. So, um, but let me know if y'all have any questions about those videos and that sort of thing. Yes. They are on web courses in the week 14 slash 15 thing, they should just be, up. they should have been just added. Um, and they are closed captioned and everything. So it, it professionally done, mind you, not just me doing it. So. Um, another thing is don't forget connecting with biology is due. The last one is due on Wednesday. If you have any questions, please make sure you ask me before it's due. I'm happy to help y'all as much as I possibly can. But once it's due, it, it, it kind of ties my hands a little bit. I think about 100 of y'all have already turned it in and have had it graded. So that's awesome. But there's still 300 of y'all left. And I'd really like to see more than, you know, 350, 400 people actually turn it in instead of like 100 people just choosing not to do it. So please take advantage of it. It's an easy 5%. You can ask anybody that's already completed it. It doesn't take that long to do. And it's really easy to knock down. Yeah. Also, don't forget that your final exam is coming up on December 10th. It'll be at 10 a.m. It'll take about an hour to complete at most with 40 questions, just like all of our other exams. Again, non-cumulative. You can take it online or in person. One thing I do want to point out about this, though, if you plan to take this test in person, you need to be here at 10 a.m. If, by some chance, you miss that, there will be no in-person makeups. You have to make it up online. So just keep that in mind, just because with finals week and how short of a turnaround I have, I'm not really able to facilitate in-person makeups. So if you want to take the test in person, make sure you're here that morning, okay? Also, don't forget that there's an extra credit assignment due for this as well. Um, again, it's due on Friday, so I can have a little bit of time to make sure I get it all graded. And I'm going to compile all these little species accounts into a single document. So y'all, as you're heading out of here, we'll have something around the neighborhood of a hundred species little booklet that talks about all the different organisms on campus that y'all all contributed to. So kind of neat. I think it's really cool. Um, we're hoping to maybe expand this idea a little bit more next semester and we'll see. It should be fun. All right. Does anybody have any questions or anything like that before we get started? Yes. So um, she asked if you can take the exam ahead of time, if you're taking it online. And unfortunately, the answer is no. Um, it's not in my control. But basically, the one thing I did make as a concession is the final exam for December 10th runs from midnight until 11.59 p.m. So you have the entire day, literally all 24 hours to take it. And I've seen some people really like that. So if you want to stay up till midnight and take it that, that morning, go, go for it. Have fun. I wouldn't recommend it, but, you know, it is what it is. But yeah, that's something that the biology department asks. It has to be still on that contiguous day, but I'm giving that full 24 hours to give you all space in case something happens, especially since there's not as much wiggle room if things were to fail. Now, that doesn't mean wait until 11 o'clock at night to take it. Because more than likely, I won't be checking my email because, you know, I'll be asleep like a normal human being. So 
All right, any other questions? All right, as always, remember if I'm getting a little too quick, just flag me down or if you have questions about specific things, stop me. I'm always happy to go further in depth on something, but you know, if something's not making sense, stop me. All right. So today we're gonna to be talking about disease ecology, uh, which is a really cool, fascinating thing where we look at how all the different elements of an ecosystem, the environment, the hosts, and the pathogen, all kind of determine whether or not you're gonna have actual infection or disease. Now keep in mind, infection and disease are two different things. So you can be infected with something and be just fine. Think about some of the non-symptomatic cases of COVID or common cold or something like that. You're still infected, you still have the pathogen, but you're physically fine. There's no real change in your behavior, your fitness, anything like that. However, when you progress to disease is when you're actually having that negligible effect on your body and where you're actually, whether it be your body responding to that pathogen or just the effects of that pathogen itself, that's where you're actually having these issues. And again, Keep in mind that all of these things can be related back to humans as well, as well as plants. It's not just a wildlife problem. Now, diseases in wildlife is becoming a huge cause for concern. And now diseases always existed in wildlife. We know going back hundreds of years that there's always been disease present. But up until recently, we haven't really evaluated how bad this is for some wildlife populations. And the thing is, is honestly, disease is starting to play a larger role with many pathogens causing large declines in numerous species. A great example of this is something like the frog, the group of the entire clade of frogs. About 50% of all frog species are either threatened or endangered as a direct result of disease, which has caused a neurons in general and amphibians in general to be the worst hit group of vertebrates when it comes to endangered taxa. <clears throat> in other words, Amphibians are the worst when it comes to being threatened by some sort of disease or something like that. Now, why is this? Well, first you get things like invasive disease. Now, obviously, we've talked a lot about evolution, right? And if you've evolved to cope with something, it means you probably evolved some defenses to it, right? Now, when humans are moving a lot of things around the planet, the diseases that are in those animals often go with them. As a result, those things will spill over into the native community and those native hosts that don't necessarily have that evolved relationship are gonna be a lot more vulnerable. We see this in you know, classic examples like rhinopest, pests, which is basically where they brought African cattle, to, or sorry, cattle to the continent of Africa and it wiped out a lot of the ungulate population. So a lot of your elands and your gazelles and things like that, as well as this white nose syndrome, which is something happening just right now where it's a disease, a fungal disease in back that's causing them to stay awake all night. And so that as a result, they can't rest and they die off. And this is something happening in the last 10 years or so, where at some point, some caver who had spent time in Europe, spent some time in North America and brought the pathogen with them. Or her. But there's also another concern that we have to think about. And that's the disease affecting species of special concern. So if you're already dealing with habitat loss or a bunch of other different things that are causing your populations to crash, a disease is gonna be a lot more effective because if you wipe out one population out of a hundred, it's not that big of a deal. But if you wipe out one population out of 10 or one population out of five, it's not much bigger of a problem. And so you see examples like this with the Chiricahua and leopard frog, which again has maybe 500 adults in the wild in general. And so BD has swept through this population and has completely removed like two or three of the last vestiges of the population and only isolated down to a couple of places. As well as these black footed ferrets, which are affected by some or canine distemper. So a common disease that we think of, relatively speaking, in you know, domestic dogs and that sort of stuff, is jumping into other carnivores and as a result, completely wiping them out. And again, you can kind of have a combination of these two things where you've got invasive diseases affecting species of special concern. And again, this kind of stuff happens in even human populations. When a lot of European settlers came to the United States to begin with, they brought things like smallpox with them. While this wasn't always intentional, there were some times that it was. Um, this was often a jump over or a spillover event where people from Europe would bring diseases with them 
and it would happen to you know get insisted into the populations of people that were already here. And because they hadn't evolved those kinds of uh, relationships with that pathogen, they didn't do it successfully with it. And again, this is that whole concept of microevolution where these changes are happening on such a small scale, relatively speaking, and such a or from a time standpoint at least, where you're only having you know evolution occurring in the last say hundred couple of years. And as a result, you can have massive changes in how a person responds to a disease in one place versus the other. Now that the world is a lot more global, this has become a lot less of a problem because obviously we're intermixing with each other a lot more than we used to say back in the 1600s. You know, we can jump on a plane in, in Australia in, in less than a day. That's kind of changed this dynamic for humans as well. Now, understanding the disease ecology of this pathogen has thus become really important to understand where disease is going to show up, what kind of species it's going to affect, and what kind of concern we should have for this animal or pathogen. So where do parasites and pathogens fit exactly into our understanding of ecology? So I just want to throw this definition out there initially. Disease ecology is simply the study of the species interactions and the abiotic components of the environment that affect patterns and process of disease. So in other words, the species, in this case, either the host or the pathogen itself, and how those two things interact with the environment around them, and that manifests either disease or no disease. A lot of that stuff is really important when you're trying to determine how do we handle imperiled species? How do we deal with humans when you're talking about epidemiology? A lot of that kind of fun stuff. So let's take a look at some of these interactions. Keep in mind, they're not always a straight definition of you know, positive and negative. Now, obviously, you have classic parasitic interactions where a parasite can usually follow two major groups. You have that kind of predation scenario, which we've talked about before, where you're going to have a positive effect on your host, or sorry, on your uh, pathogen, and a negative effect on your host. But this isn't always the case. And there's a lot of gray area with this as well. There's quite a bit of a gradient, if you will, which is that more immensalistic scenario, where you have a positive benefit for that pathogen and a neutral benefit to the host. And the kind of tipping point between that neutral and that negative thing can often be a very, very small difference. But in general, you can find that parasitic interactions evolve either one of these two scenarios. Now, if you remember back to week 12, the quiz that was on there, I asked you which of these scenarios had a positive benefit and a neutral benefit, or at least a neutral benefit, right? And your options were either amensalism or uh, uh, mutualism, right? And keep in mind, again, this is why I put these in doubt and why I kind of put that question on there, because there's a little bit of gray area, there's a little bit of trickiness to it. And determining what's truly positive and what's neutral is kind of difficult sometimes. So let's put this in context of things that we've already talked about a little bit here. So I showed you earlier this, pair, this food web, right? We're looking at a typical forest here in the southeast, kind of deer, squirrels, mice, some beetles that aren't going to be reliant on food, caterpillars that can be eaten off those trees, all this kind of fun stuff. Classic, right? Well, kind of the interesting thing about this is when you account for the parasite, all of a sudden you have this new dominant predator, if you will, that top of the food chain. It's not the giant deer that we think about that's probably a thousand times larger than a tick, it's a tick. So the thing that's kind of benefiting the most from that system is that thing, right? Now, obviously, this isn't just the case in these small, relatively simple ecosystems. When you look at these much larger ecosystems, where again you have down here green are your classic producers, and red here you have consumers. Finally, in blue, you have pathogens or parasites. See how quickly all these connections can form. There's just a massive amount of interactions. Now, ultimately, the more points you add, the more interconnected that web becomes. However, if you start to remove these points, the whole web could collapse, right? 
And again, this is all stuff we've kind of talked about a little bit here, but I want to kind of really hit home these points because ultimately, right, you can't just eradicate disease and hope that everything's going to work out, especially when it comes to particular pathogens or vectors of pathogens like mosquitoes. There's often other connections into that food web that could cause massive collapses. So it's more about mitigation than it is about removing. Let's use this as an example. What if we could just make all the mosquitoes in the world disappear, right? Gone instantly. How about some of y'all give me some benefits of why that might be useful? Yeah. You don't have malaria. Yeah, no more malaria, right? You lose that vector. Humans do better as a result of it, right? Or somebody else. What's another benefit of getting rid of mosquitoes like that? Sorry? Yeah, exactly. You're removing that vector, right? You're getting rid of that ability for that parasite or pathogen to move to another organism. So let's talk about some of the ones that I was able to come up with here. So you have less disease in that in the world, right? You get less instances of things like West Nile, yellow fever, malaria being able to be transmitted to hosts, be able to stick around in populations. You'd also have a less need for pesticide, right? Because if you're not trying to get rid of those vectors, you're not just dumping all that pesticide down into the environment, and as a result, killing a lot of non-target hosts. Things like bees, uh, butterflies, moths, beetles, all that kind of fun stuff can still be affected by pesticides just like mosquito can. And while we try to use as specific and as targeted as possible, it's not always perfect. But what about some drawbacks? Why shouldn't we just kill off all the mosquitoes? Exactly. Mosquitoes are the basis for a lot of food chains, right? A ton of animals, different animals eat from them. And if you remove them, you collapse entire food chains. How about another benefit? Yeah. Mosquitoes that are spread by mosquitoes help to regulate animals that don't have like natural predators. That's a fantastic answer, and one I haven't even come up with. When you have that spread by disease of mosquitoes, it helps remove some of the sick and kind of older individuals from a population. And as a result, not only are you producing food for carrion eaters like vultures, you're kind of helping to pick out and determine the best possible evolutionary outcome for a particular species or population. Now, what if I told you moving all the mosquitoes is going to probably destroy the air? Makes sense, right? So let's put this into context. Mosquitoes are stupid abundant, and their aquatic offspring is the basis for incredible numbers of food webs. So here you can kind of see an example of just how simple just mosquitoes are in this very relatively minor food web. And ultimately, if you lose mosquitoes, you're going to lose a wide variety of different organisms. Everything from mosquito fish, which are so named because that's their primary diet, pretty much all they eat is mosquito larvae. Bats, although that's a vampire bat, so it doesn't quite work. Um, toads and frogs and that sort of thing. Lizards and salamanders and lots of other reptiles. Things like uh, small birds often re rely on mosquitoes, which is kind of funny to think about because you often don't think of mosquitoes as being big enough for a lot of these birds to eat. The thing about purple martins, it's almost like a short diet. And finally, other insects. And who could also forget, also in this picture, does anybody know what that is? It's sundews. Close. But it's a sundew plant. It's a carnivorous plant. By having that very specialized diet, often in places where mosquito larvae persist really well, and as a result, you have lots of adult mosquitoes around, they can get nitrogenous bases and all that kind of fun stuff out of those animals and use that as building blocks for their own genetic material. Ultimately, the big picture thing here is parasites shape the entire ecological community and help the structure where all can live in a certain area. In other words, you have to think about the parasites and the pathogens. Otherwise, you're not going to understand what's actually going on. And all the effort you put into trying to figure that out is going to be useless. But how exactly do we do that? 
kind of a big open-ended question, right? So here's a couple of examples. Parasites can often hamper the fitness of one species to allow another to coexist. This is called parasite mediated competition. So here you have the mean proportion of survival, either controlled or affected, and the mean mass in just one species of frog, right? Well, it's pretty obvious that as you increase the number of diseases or the amount of diseases that's present in this environment, the amount of animals that survive to see metamorphosis is dramatically lower. However, what's really cool, if you look down here, the individuals that survive because that pathogen wiped out a number of them are going to be much healthier. They're thicker. They've got more body fat on them. They're going to be able to persist better in the environment than they would have if they'd been in a non affected environment. Kind of cool, right? And here's another great example of this. Again, kind of blowing this up here. The different pieces of frog, you have the max here on the left, and then their their rear division. See how actually this dependence might affect them. They have again control and affected. So in a low density situation where you don't have that many frogs stocked at a particular pond, this difference doesn't really matter all that much. However, when you have that much higher density where there's a ton more frogs, when you've got more infected frogs, the average survival is lower, but that mass is larger. They're more healthy, they're going to persist better. Kind of cool, right? But parasites can also hamper competition in different ways. So it's not just intraspecific, you know, between the same members of the same species, but interspecific. So in other words, it's between members of different species. So here you have a really cool example here in St. Martin, where you have two different species of lizards. Now, one of these lizards is a lot more affected by the same pathogen that causes malaria in humans. So you can see that this one has a much stronger effect than this one. What's really cool is you can basically see this little dotted line here, right? That shows you where that malaria is concentrated on the island. Now, I notice if you look, all of these little dots outside of that little area are black, indicating that the majority, if not all of the adults that are observed in this area, are this kind of animal. However, Inside this little cord and mouth area, all these are open with white dots, which is indicative of this one. In other words, because this malaria is present, it's allowing two different species to persist on the landscape. Granted, they're being subdivided out into two different niches, one where the package is present, one where it's not, instead of just one. It's completely changed the dynamics of competition on its head. Really cool, right? And here's another great example of this. And this is called apparent competition. And this differs in that the ability of the parasite to utilize the host is different. And as a result, one species is going to be more likely to succeed, whereas the other one's going to be less likely to, more likely to commit. Here you have an example of this nematode that exists in uh, Drosophila or you know, fruit flies. And this nematode only exists below the mason, relatively the mason mason. But you can see that pretty well clearly related here. Now, if you go above that line, those darker circles are a lot more prevalent, right? However, if you drop down, it's almost completely white circles. And again, it's not completely being eradicated. They're not, there is some level of sharing between these two populations of species. But for the most part, you have that perfect resource partitioning, that niche partitioning that allows for more diversity than there would be without. So you can see really quickly that diseases and pathogens have a really important kind of place in preserving biodiversity, ironically. However, these kinds of relationships can also be extremely detrimental. In other words, certain species can just be absolutely hammered and wiped out by disease. And again, this comes back to things like invasive species can completely disrupt these relationships. A great example of this that's currently happening here in Central Florida is how many of y'all know that we have invasive snakes in the Everglades that are like 12 feet long, right? It's pretty easy to get people scared about big, you know, boa constrictors or pythons, right? But ironically, one of the worst problems for this whole situation has nothing to do with the pythons themselves. 
It has to do with this little lungworm that came with them. I forget the exact name of it, it starts with an R, but it's this little um, five hooked uh, worm that lives inside of the lungs. Now in Burmese pythons, between just the co-evolution that happened between these two things, as well as just being a much bigger snake, these uh, parasites seem much, much smaller. And as a result, really don't affect the python all that much. However, when you dump those pythons into South Florida, and not only are you getting reproduction of the pythons themselves and causing problems down in the Everglades, but you're getting a reproduction of that parasite as well. And it's now able to find all these more native hosts, things like pygmy rattlesnakes, indigo snakes, eastern diamondbacks, all three of which are protected at least in some way, shape, or form here in the state. Now, what's really interesting is that the parasite itself is expanding its range dramatically faster than the actual pythons. The pythons are probably going to stay down in South Florida and never really do anything. But yeah, it's going to affect the Everglades and that system, but you're probably never going to see them in Orlando. So in the grand scheme of things, they're not that catastrophic. I don't say that to downplay the effect of the python itself, but I say that to highlight that this pathogen that started out as just kind of a waif traveler with these pythons, hitched a ride with them, and is now ending up way, way north in South Carolina and Georgia, in Louisiana and Alabama. And as a result, we think it's actually killing off a lot of the dusty pygmy rattlesnake populations. In fact, um, there's a place not too far from here called Postahatchee Wildlife Management Area that for 10 years, the UCF herpetology class would go out there and find somewhere between three to seven pygmy rattlesnakes just walking around in about 20 minutes or so. The last three years, we haven't seen them. More than likely, this is probably the cause, but until we find dead animals or we find some living ones with heavily infected bodies, we won't know for sure. That kind of complicates why this could be a problem. Now, even if an introduced species isn't successful, the disease it carries can jump into a new host and cause these known spillover events. A great example of this is um, there's a disease called Patricopitrium salamandrivores, or the salamander eater fungus. It's very similar to that BD disease I've been talking about a couple times in here, but it's just focused on salamander. Well, when it was originally imported in from Asia through uh, newt breeders, because apparently that's a huge thing in Germany of all places, um, those newts brought with them that pathogen. And it jumped into native species, even though those animals never even may have gone to the wild, but because somebody handled their captive animal and then handled the wild animal without washing their hands or killing off their spores, now you have a disease that's wiping out entire populations of salamanders all across Europe. So it doesn't have to become established. You don't have to have that invasive host. You just have to have a, a doorway, an entry point for that disease to show up. And again, these spillovers can be pretty catastrophic. We've talked a little bit about BD and how it's kind of a nasty disease and it's the worst disease known to science. But it's nothing until you go out and you walk a stream and literally every frog you see is dead or dying. Kind of impressive. Or you look out and see all these cute little bats. They're slowly being suffocated and killed off by a fungus that got left there because somebody was careless. Think about these things. So thus, it's really important to know how a species is going to shape the disease community of an area, right? We need to know what kind of effects that either the host or the pathogen is going to have on that system. How exactly do we do that? So numerous factors can impact whether or not a pathogen infection causes mortality, where you'll have the pathogen just being present there, and if it will ultimately result in disease. But ultimately, you need the intersection of three things, a susceptible host, the favorable environment for that uh, pathogen to persist, both in the host and in general, and of course, the pathogen just to be there present in the first place. But you can break these things into a lot more specific uh, categories. For instance, when you're talking about host effects, you can get into things like immunogenetics. For instance, in vertebrates, we often look at the major histocompatibility compatibility complex genes or the MHC gene. They code for proteins that are essential for acquired immune response. They're generally classified into two different groups, either class one or class two. Class one focuses on self-on-self-recognition of cells, 
In other words, cancer cells, whether or not they're infected with the virus, that sort of thing. Where SLAC2 is going to be for kind of organisms that are extracellular, things like funguses, bacterial cells, that sort of thing. And ultimately, this peptide binding region or PBR codes for whether or not that MHC is going to be able to bind to the antigens on the pathogen. In other words, will it be able to recognize that that pathogen is there and it needs to kill that cell? And you can have a lot of different levels of evolution that can play on this, things like balancing selection, or you can have 10 different alleles being maintained in the population because maybe allele A is good at defeating pathogen A and allele B, B is good at killing pathogen B, but they're both present in the population, so you need both of them at different times. Or directional selection, like we've talked about, where you have actually kind of that push towards one specific allele for a specific gene. Ultimately, the specific alleles at these loci directly relate to the ability of an individual to respond to a disease. And you can do, and it's led to cool things like using CRISPR Pax9 to cut out a specific allele and putting it into a species and hoping that that animal is going to survive much better now due to the disease presence. But host effects aren't just within an individual, they can be on the community level where a community composition can have a strong impact on the ability for a pathogen to affect individuals within a community. You can have pressure from that pathogen to shape entire communities through things like a parent competition, right? Back to that fruit fly example. Some fruit flies did really well with one pathogen, some did with others. And as a result, you had that niche partitioning where they could both coexist. Additionally, certain hosts can either augment or decrease the amount of pathogen in the environment. A great example of that is things like bats and Ebola where just by having bats present in the environment, it's going to skyrocket the amount of Ebola cases in the general area. Because they're a competent host. They carry it around and they amplify the amount of pathogen inside of them. And so when they interact with humans, it's a lot more prevalent than it would have been. And as a result, you have much more likelihood that you're going to see that present in the populations. Additionally, you're gonna have things like lizards and Lyme disease. It's a really cool relationship and something that's very influential to why here in Florida, we really don't have Lyme disease, or at least, prevalent cases. And the reason for that is that lizards are terrible hosts for it. And so when the tick bites onto this lizard and that Lyme disease tries to go into that lizard, it's gonna die. Whereas up north, where you have a lot more mammal hosts, there's gonna be a lot more competent hosts for that pathogen. that's gonna be able to stick around a lot longer. Yeah. I honestly have no idea. <laughs> So that bat species was one that's directly related to one of the African, uh, West African countries that was having an Ebola outbreak back in the 2014. I couldn't specifically tell you what species, but there's some really funky looking ones out there. They're really fascinating. But again, you can also have those environmental effects. These can often be related to things like climate, where, for instance, average temperature and Katrina mycosis. If the average temperature is below about 75 degrees, it's going to do really well. It's going to kill off everything. However, if it gets above 85 consistently, then this is all in Fahrenheit. It's going to do a well. lot. It's going to honestly do terrible. So, places like New Orleans or Florida, where BD is present, but it just doesn't have really good strength of effects. And that's why we really don't see BD as being a problem for the state. You can also have weird things like soil conversation. And that's all based off of how well those hosts or those pathogens can survive pre infection. And that kind of just depends on the pathogen, depends on a wide variety of things. But here in Aspirin, the low sensitive to fungus, it needs really wet and moist habitats to survive. And so as a result, you often see it in things like ducks instead of things like pigeons, because they're feeding in that really wet, and moist soil in those grasses. And as a result, they're much more likely to pick up those Aspirin, the fungal parasite pores. And ultimately, you also have things like the pathogen effects itself. So the things that the pathogen does to be able to avoid or immune systems. Um, there's a lot of different ways this can happen where you've got the pathogen's ability to colonize a host. Things like H5N1 or the influenza virus or COVID-19. They're all very good at colonizing hosts and they kind of quickly become established and effective, right? Why there's such a problem. Things like the amount of pathogen in the environment, just in general. Because if you have more pathogen in the environment, you're probably going to be more likely to be infected. Pretty straightforward. As well as how well the pathogen can avoid detection. 
HIV is perfect at this, where it has antigens that are designed to that community be picked up by whatever immune system that's trying to fight it. As a result, it's a lot more deadly than just hide out and wait for up to 10 to 50 years before it's actually going to be activated. Ultimately, understanding how all these factors interact can allow us to understand when and where outbreaks can occur. And using these kinds of approaches can allow us to answer the fundamental questions needed to properly respond to a pathogen. All right. So let's put this in context of the real world, an actual case study that we're here in the lab are working on. Keep in mind that this is unpublished data, so still going through peer review, but it's kind of neat to see the process as it's actually happening. And we're constantly refining these things as it's going through. Let's focus on a disease that I study. It's called Potentia. It's a little protist like organism. Um, it's not currently formally described, which is part of the reason why it's not really well recognized in the literature. And as a result, you may see a bunch of different names for it, such as German mycoides or a Potentia like organism, because it's most closely related to the Potentia pathogen that you see in things like oysters. Hope you all haven't eaten yet. This parasite primarily affects members of the family Ranidae or the true frogs. Some of y'all might have seen some of these, your leopard frogs, your bullfrogs, these poor little dusty broken frogs that are getting absolutely hammered by this cat. And the way it does this is by causing damage to the liver and the intestines. So if you're looking at this diagram up here, all these little circles right here are the actual pathogen itself. It's sitting into the liver tissue and it's slowly eating it away. Kind of like the, the parasite in the movie Eli, where it's inside of you and it's eating all your internal organs from the inside out. It's really kind of dark. And as a result, you can see all these plastic hemorrhages you see here, where it's almost looking like it's bleeding out from inside. And here you can actually see the liver of an asshole. You know, it's completely clear. All that's left of that liver is just the outer edge of the membrane. That liver is basically an entire little sack full of these little protist parasites that are getting ready to burst force and kill this animal. Kind of metal, right? And again, unfortunately, we know next nothing about it. And most of this literature has occurred in the gray literature, which basically means it's not formally reviewed. But you should always kind of discount a little bit. Now, here in Florida, we know it's pretty prevalent. We find it in places like the St. Martin's National Wildlife Refuge in Wakala and Hernandez County, which is way out on the panhandle, as well as places like Pebble Lake that's only at the State Park, which is almost closer to Ocala, so we know it's pretty far down into the state as well. And even right here on campus. And unfortunately, we've seen a number of large die-offs directly caused by this disease, specifically at that Pebble Lake site, which included species of special concern, the Florida Gopher Frog. So given all this information, we sought simply just to determine where this thing's occurring, what kind of prevalences are where, and what kind of infection intensities we're going to see in different species, different locations, all that kind of fun stuff. Now, in order to do that, we went out and collected samples monthly from 20 different wetlands here in Florida. And after the first year, we cut that down to eight because that was ridiculous. I basically did for every for at least one week out of the month, I was spending just out in the field doing this. It's kind of difficult to pull off. And this required probably in the neighborhood of 20 different people to help me with a lot of the sampling. So just want to go ahead and say thank you for all that. You can actually see the breakdown of all these different sites. Including a site right here on campus that's the native pond. It's actually just out in the Arboretum. Um, probably most of y'all have made it that that far. As well as places like the Disney Wilderness Preserve, down towards the Kissimmee area. Forever Florida, which used to be a um, private ranch that was also a zip line attraction. We now just back to the private ranch again. The Clyde Springs and Rock Springs Run State Preserve. So up here on the north side, kind of near Old Swamp Springs. And finally that Pebble Lake site because we knew that there were infections there already. And when we did catch these animals, we used the standardized method so that we could account for how many individuals that were there. We use that as a way of quantifying. Oh, we know based off of our numbers of frogs here, what the overall population looks like. And then we can collect tissue as well from, both the, from these individuals, both tadpoles and adults. And finally, we collected the, a bunch of different environmental parameters to try to test and see where these animals are, or where this disease is more likely to occur and what kind of habitats. 
to actually look for the pathogen. We extracted all the DNA from uh, the tissue itself using a tiny DNA kit. And then we use something called qPCR or quantitative PCR, which is basically where we take the DNA, we put a little fluorescent piece of phosphorus on it, and we replicate it over and over and over and over and over again. And ultimately, what we're hoping is that if, it's, if the animal is positive, it has that pathogen, we're able to replicate that DNA over and over and over again so we can detect it and quantify how many copies of it were there. Ultimately, all those samples that were tested positive the first time were run a second time and a third time to confirm if that actually is truly the right amount, as well if it's a true infection positive or not. Then we did a bunch of statistical stuff on the back end. Ultimately, we collected 1,232 individuals um, from 20 different locations. From those individuals, we found that 395 of them were positive from and at least one tissue type. And from that, 37% of juveniles, so little miniature frogs, tadpoles were 29% effective, which is kind of weird because that's the first time they've seen that they're the lower ones. And finally, adults were around 34%. All but one species we found to be effective. However, we only found one in the study, and we found a bunch more in other places, and they all they were also infected. And what's really interesting is 132 of these animals were also found to be co infected with another pathogen, ranavirus, which is kind of like the Ebola of the process. Really nasty stuff, too. And there you had a significantly higher chance of if you were already infected with Burkinsia, you were going to be more likely to be infected with ranavirus, as well as if you were infected with ranavirus, you're more likely to be infected with Burkinsia. Kind of neat. Here you can see the breakdown based off of those five groups here, where up top you have the prevalence, which is basically zero, one, zero, none of the animals in that population had it, one, all of them did. Then here you have a log transform version of the genomic equivalent, or in other words, how many gene copies are we detecting every time we're running this test? And we log transform this because it can be anything from one to billions. And so, in order for those facts to work, you have to log transform. And something you'll see pretty quickly is that all of these letters basically mean that there's a difference. So if you've got an A and an A, they're the same, there's no statistical difference. But if you've got A and B, there's a difference there, or A and C for that matter. So here on campus, we have this, the significantly lowest amount of Perkinsia of anywhere tested. So that's kind of cool, right? Whereas in places like Pebble Lake, where we know that there's really high levels of infection, there's been mortality events. But it's significantly higher infection or prevalence than anywhere else. And what's really cool is you can also see similar trends with the infection intensity. Where Pebble Lake and Rock Springs had significantly higher infection intensity compared to Forever Florida, but they weren't different than, say, UCF or CWP. And here you can see a breakdown by species and family. Basically, all these are different species. One thing I really do want to point out here's your Florida gopher frog. Highest prevalence of any species, highest infection intensity of any species. Kind of scary, right? But what's really cool is we can also come over here and look at human tree frogs, some of the lowest prevalence of any species. So, in other words, maybe this invasive species really doesn't affect the cancer levels at all. So if you look, it's not significant, but it's also one of the lower infection intensity that we can factor for any groups. Now, here it is by month. You can look at prevalence at the top again, at the bottom. If you look, it's really strong in the winter. It crashes down all the way to July. It's picking up until September because of the rains that usually hit during the summer. Drop back down again and then back up towards the end for December. So it's a really strong seasonal uh, trend where you see these different months mean different infection intensities. And so it's really important to sample not just in July, but in January and December as well, because you really need to see how much it's going to change depending on the different season. And finally, this is kind of sad too. Over the course of our study, we found somewhere in the neighborhood of 15 animals that were found dead. They were you know, bloated and nasty looking, so we weren't always able to get these things amplified. And so here you can see there was no significant difference between the reflected from alive to dead with the prevalence was. Honestly, that probably has more to do with the fact that there's just crappy tissue at some point. But when you look at infection intensity between alive and dead individuals, significantly higher. 
So we can't 100% with certainty say that these animals died with Perkinsia. Sure as hell looks like it. And finally, this is a really cool thing for those of y'all especially that are into computer science. How many of y'all have heard of neural networking? Yeah, really cool, right? Using kind of a computer's attempt at trying to match and equivalent itself to neurons to kind of find out what connections make the most sense. Well, these are all the results of something called the random forest model, which uses machine learning to basically say, we're gonna run thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of different equations to say, which of these factors make the most sense when trying to explain where frequency is gonna show up and whether or not an individual is gonna be affected by that. So what's kind of interesting is you have two different factors. You have this mean decrease in accuracy and this mean decrease in Gini. And ultimately what these mean is, is as you're removing a particular thing, that's that drop off that you're seeing in that quality of that model and whether or not it's going to predict present. So top, unsurprisingly, month location species. And you can see that was pretty clear when you looked at just the general population trends, right? It made sense that month would probably be pretty explanatory, especially if you're talking about July or location or species for that matter. But there were some other interesting things too, like your average temperature where that sample was collected or randomized prevalence. So in other words, the prevalence of another disease. Uh, things like up here, this H, Shannon diversity index. The higher the Shannon diversity index, the more likely there were to that animal that, if, so if, mm -hmm. terrible explanation, my bad. Um, so if an animal was existing in a location that had a really high Shannon diversity index, it was more likely to be infected than, than if an organism that was living in a lower Shannon diversity index location. So in other words, diversity is not always the best thing in the world. Ultimately, what we were able to conclude is that all sites found the stupid pathogen and with all sites having multiple wetlands containing infected frogs. There was a strong pattern with seasonality with winter months and early September having that really high prevalence. And finally, unsurprisingly, random frogs, which we thought were gonna be pretty heavily infected, had the highest prevalence of any organism or any group. But ultimately, given that really high level of potency in Florida, it's important to continue to monitor where this disease was showing up, as well as what kind of conditions may be facilitating these situations. And this is kind of the nice bite at the apple, a quick look at some of these situations. But this stuff changes over time. And so understanding how this is kind of a snapshot now will be important going forward for things like climate change, habitat destruction, introduction of invasive species, all that other kind of fun stuff. And we'll talk a little bit more about that on Wednesday. Now, I do want to say that there's an amazing group of people, somewhere in the neighborhood of like 12 different undergrads and all health limits that would come out and sample with me because I couldn't go out by myself. So people die that way. Well, a ton of different fun resources. So, with that, I'll take any of y'all's questions as well as just remember your typical announcements. Yes. Can you that's a really good question. So, one of there there have been people that have looked into vaccines for especially for BD because that's such a prevalent nasty disease. But the thing about vaccines is you have to find a way to administer them successfully to a number of different individuals. It's not always possible when you're talking about wild animals, right? And so even though we've had vaccines for things like rabies for like 50, 60 years, we, it's just not practical to try to get that out of the landscape. So they have tried to play around with this in some small situations where you only do it in, say, like a really threatened species in a very small location. But just because you don't have that generation to generation turnover, it's only going to work for a single generation, which often only lasts about a year, if not maybe a couple. It's just not that effective. So that's why they're looking more at things like gene editing for the major histocompatibility complex. So you can kind of, it's not a vaccine, but you're importing that model that we know already works in a frog and using that. So, yeah, let me close this down real quick and I'll come down and answer questions.